be able to. We are very sad not to be able to be in Liverpool um, uh, for this occasion, but we are very grateful for the opportunity to welcome Tom Holland to join us and for him to make some time to talk to us this evening as well. Uh, it's a great honor and it's a great pleasure for me to introduce him. Tom is an award-winning historian, biographer and broadcaster. Uh, I'm sure you would have uh, come across some of his books and perhaps read his uh, website. Uh, he's the author of various books that relate to Roman, Persian and Middle Eastern history. Um, he is the presenter on, of BBC Radio 4's Making History. Uh, he has written and presented a number of TV documentaries, as his website uh, re remind us as well. Um, <clears throat> and the session this evening will focus, I think, more on the implications of his latest book, uh, Dominion, The Making of the Western Mind, which I've got here uh, with me. Uh, if you haven't yet seen it, uh, it's definitely worth having. Now, the book was described, it has uh, endorsements by various people, but it was described by the church historian, the great um, scholar at Oxford, Dermot McCulloch. Uh, I'm reading that this extraordinary book is vintage Tom Holland, History boldly and elegantly retold, with fascinating interconnections traced to create a narrative that cannot fail to stimulate, for it leads to a never ending question. And that never ending question has, I think, to do with the understanding of the importance of Europe's Christian heritage. The book, I think, brings to the surface some focused thinking about this heritage and whether it has any specific moral substance. Um, for without it, I, I believe that would be part of the aim of this book, for without it, any such thinking, or without any such thinking, we might end up in a very typical uh, postmodern trap, the argument replaced by parallel assertions, that is. And of course, those of you who uh, are um, engaged in the study of theology might remember that several recent theologians have argued what is left if we refuse to discuss moral and spiritual foundations is simply violent competition for the power to set agendas, whether they are political, economic, and cultural, with religious commitment seen simply as a lifestyle option chosen for individual comfort alone. Now today, many in Europe and perhaps in North America too, think of facing Islam as facing a highly critical if internally diverse, global opposition. Uh, and we don't know often how best to respond, at least in the West, to its presence. There's been a lot of incoherent reactions. Historically, of course, both Europe and Islam are very closely connected. The separation is not easily um, uh, you know, explained, Islam opens up to the heritage of Greek philosophy through its encounter with the Syrian Christians in the Middle East who helped in the translation movement of a great deal of Greek philosophy. And of course, later that's reciprocated as medieval Islamic uh, uh, texts, Arabic and Islamic uh, philosophers who the great uh, Abu Reis and Avicenna and Al-Ghazali who become translated and made available in the West. So of course, there is undoubtedly a historical and philosophical interest in engaging with the world of Islam um, for us here at Europe as well. So as we thank Tom for joining us today, 
we begin in the light of this introduction. Uh, first, I ask Tom uh, whether some of the things that I just said resonate, whether he thinks that I am correct to say that they resonate with his book's message, and to explain a little bit more why he decided to call this session in particular Christianizing Islam. Thank you very much. Um, and thank you very much for inviting me. And I, I wish that I could uh, be in Liverpool. Um, hope maybe next year, perhaps, who knows? Um, well, I think I think that the easiest way to um, to, to get into the subject of the, the, the theme of Christianizing Islam is to look more broadly at how it was that I ended up writing a book about Christianity, which was never part of my life plan, I have to say, because um, pretty much from, uh, I guess, the age of 10, I tended to I identify myself with the civilizations of Greece and Rome um, and to rather resent um, uh, first uh, Christians and then the Muslims for turning up and ruining everything. Um, that was kind of very much my teenage view. Um, and so when I came to write popular history, um, the first books that I wrote were absolutely centered in the classical world. So I wrote about the Roman Republic and I wrote about the Greco-Persian Wars. But the experience of um, writing uh, books about these subjects and having to do it um, for a general audience, so having to translate it into English that the general public would readily understand and hopefully enjoy, really brought home to me the, um, the challenge of using a modern European language to articulate um, the values, the assumptions of um, a, a, a very ancient world. And I found myself again and again struggling with um, the way in which kind of certain key words had a kind of signification, a kind of significatory resonance that just felt wrong. So an obvious one would be religion. Um, you know, very learned scholars write books about ancient Greek religion, uh, about religion in ancient Rome and so on. But it just felt wrong to me to talk about the Romans having religion. It, it just felt wrong. Uh, again, likewise, in, in, in very scholarly texts, you will get people talking about the secular, say, in ancient Athens. Again, it just, you know, the secular it just felt wrong. Homosexuality, another word. Uh, it, again, it didn't seem right. Um, and this sense that the very language that I was using as an Anglophone writer was pregnant with all kinds of cultural and moral assumptions was sharpened for me when um, I wrote a book about late antiquity and about the emergence of Islam uh, against the context of the collapse of, of Roman and Persian rule in the Middle East. Um, so uh, ha again, had to kind of engage with Islam in a way that I'd never anticipated doing. And I found again, the same kind of anxiety hovering at the back of my mind when I used words like religion or secular or whatever. And um, I guess it's a bit like when you have an itch on, you know, on the back and you can't quite find it and you're kind of running around, then you get hold of it and you start scratching it and it's so good. And basically it, it was the kind of increasing realization that all these assumptions, um, all this kind of freight of signification that had been bothering me was basically because they were absolutely kind of saturated in Christian assumptions. Um, and I began to realize, that, you know, this was um, against a backdrop of a lot of discussion about um, Muslims in Europe, I guess, um, uh, against the backdrop of the Charlie Hebdo um, uh, cartoons affair and the, the various um, uh, tensions that had arisen from the background of that. Um, and the, the kind of default way in which um, people talked about the secular or in the French context, laïcité, without recognizing that both words are deeply rooted in the soil of Christian theology and history. 
uh, secular derives from the use that Augustine puts the Latin word seculum and the way that it has evolved over the course of the, the Christian centuries to become what now in English we call secular. And likewise, laicite, the French word, comes from you know, the ancient Greek word for people, which comes to have a very, very specific theological signification. And the kind of um, sense I had that um, an awful lot of modern secular society that people imagine is neutral, imagine is objective, imagine is somehow um, emancipated from uh, the flux of um, European history, that it can kind of stand and be a neutral observer. It can be a kind of umpire, it can be a referee, um, that this was an illusion. Uh, and that in fact, um, words like religion, words like secular, were not at all neutral. That um, to, 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 to kind of, to impose them on um, say uh, Greece or Rome was to kind of Christianize them. It was to look at, you know, or, or even words like democracy, which, which are kind of originally Greek ones, but they come with a kind of a, a, a Christian haze, a kind of, you, like it's like you're wearing Christian contact lenses that prevents you from seeing just how different, just how, to our minds, how strange, how remote these, these peoples were. And so I be, be, became increasingly conscious of the way in which the same was true of what I think, you know, in Britain and more generally uh, uh, across the West are unproblematically described as religions. Um, Hinduism is, or Buddhism, you know, these are the kind of classic examples of the way in which um, in the colonial period, Europeans basically forced a, um, a Christian and perhaps a more specifically Protestant template on cultures and societies that had no conception of the secular or the religious, because these were very, very distinctive cultural uh, frameworks for conceptualizing society. But of course, um, this also impacts on, um, and I don't know what the word is, um, religions, um, cultural expressions, civilizations, um, peoples perhaps would be the most, the, 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 the best way of putting it. Um, the Jew, the, you know, the, 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 the nation of Israel, the children of Israel, the Jews, and um, the Muslim people, the Ummah, the global community of Muslims. Um, that to kind of compact these ideas and to repackage them and to reframe them as religions. And then in the context of a Western society, to say to, say to Muslims, uh, yes, you have freedom of religion, but that's the obligation then on Muslims is to assume that they belong to something called a religion. If they start to assume that they belong to something called an Ummah, which has uh, you know, a, a, an identity that transcends the limits of the, the liberal secular state, then all kinds of tensions start to develop. And it did seem to me that um, essentially the great project of uh, secular liberal democracy uh, and its relationship to what um, you know, are, are called the multi-religious um, uh, community is um, essentially to Christianize them. That, that just as Jews in the 19th century were kind of emancipated, but on the understanding basically that they had to identify themselves as belonging not to a people, but to a religion, to something called Judaism, which was um, you know, a Christian neologism. No Jew used that until the 19th century. Um, so likewise, um, in uh, modern Europe, um, in the, the, the decades that have seen a growing Muslim population in Europe, the obligation on Muslims is very similar, that they have freedom of religion, yes, but the kind of implicit implication of that is that they have to Christianize themselves. And this is kind of all the more insidious for the fact that most secularists do not see themselves as having been shaped by the inheritance of Christian theology. They see themselves as objective, as neutral. Uh, and of course, it's, it's difficult to, to, to kind of emphasize, to, to, to kind of point this out too sharply, because in a, in a sense, the entire functioning of a secular democracy relies on the conceit that the framework of the secular is neutral, 
but it, 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 it you know it is a, a kind of neutral ring a neutral space in which Christians and Muslims and Jews and Hindus and everybody can be treated equally but in fact it's much easier for Christians mm -hmm. to exist in a secular state where you have the notion of church and state because as the phrase church and state suggests, it's an inherently Christian categorization. So that in a sense was the perspective that I, I brought to, to, to writing Dominion. It was one that was shaped by my desire to look at how the evolution of Christianity and the way that it's been the kind of the dominant way of, of understanding the world um, in, uh, in, in Britain for you know a thousand years and more the way that it has uh, has shaped how we in Britain understand the the pre-Christian past but also how it has shaped how how um, uh, British imperialism has uh, and Western imperialism more generally has shaped the way that um, uh, the, the broader world sees itself. Yes well thank you that's very <clears throat> that's very interesting and um, I recall a lot of these discussions being raised very um, uh, in a very focused way in, in the book in various chapters as you go through these various periods um, uh, and how the church in a sense was the most kind of uh, um, surviving institution that has shaped much of the post-Roman empire period uh, and its engagement with, with Roman law, et cetera, et cetera. Now, if I understand you well, therefore, um, you are suggesting that, that Christianity perhaps has more in common with the Enlightenment legacy than it might have with Islam. Um, would that be a right thing to say in your well, perspective? I, I mean, I think, I think the Enlightenment is, is clearly a, a kind of recalibration of fundamentally Christian assumptions. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think there's a clue in the very word enlightenment, um, the idea that the people who walk in darkness must be brought to see light is one that, um, you know, it's older than Christianity, it's rooted in, in, um, in the Old Testament, in the book, in the prophet, in Old Testament prophets. Um, and I think that what you see in uh, the history of Christianity is, and particularly in Western Christianity, um, is, it's, it, it's kind of like it's kind of like San Francisco built on the San Andreas fault. There is uh, it, it is built Christian civilization, if we can call it that, is is in the West, is founded on a sense that um, every orthodoxy, um, every uh, every kind of structure, ultimately um, has to be overthrown, has to be questioned. And that this is implicit within the kind of distinctively Western understanding of Christianity, which I think emerges in the 11th century. Um, because what happens in the 11th century is that this fundamental idea, which goes back to Augustine, and again, you don't get in kind of Orthodox Christianity, you don't get in, um, in uh, uh, the Eastern churches, but this distinctively Latin understanding that the world can be divided into the city of man and the city of God. That the city of man is swept up on the flux of the cyclum, on the on the span of living memory, um, and that uh, human beings and empires alike are born upon its flux and will be swept away like leaves on a turbid river, uh, and that that is counterpointed to the radiant eternity of heaven, and that the way that humans can get to heaven, that they can overcome the flux of the cyclum, is by the bond, the religio, that the church provides. And that this establishes a kind of a, a template for under, understanding society that in the 11th century is weaponized by um, uh, people who seize control of the commanding heights of the bishopric of Rome, the, the, um, the most significant bishopric in Latin Christendom. And they uh, essentially use this idea that um, the church uh, is, is clothed in, in radiant robes and that um, earthly emperors, earthly kings, if they try and um, bend the church to their own uses, their grubby fingers are that you know they will leave the fingerprints of a rapist on the on the radiant robes of the church, and therefore they have to be told to back off. 
And this is a kind of startlingly radical way of conceptualizing society. It's not one that would have made sense to, to previous generations of, of Christians, let alone to you know, the, 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 the pre-Christian Roman world. Um, but it's one that, that, that gets forced through. And it essentially what the reformers, um, and, and they, the reformers, you know, they use the Latin word reformatio, the remaking of the whole of Christendom, Essentially, what they're doing is they are applying to the great sweep of, of, of Christian earthly society, the understanding that is brought to the individual Christian, that the individual Christian must be cleansed of sin, that the sin must be washed away, and, can, and that the Christian can be born again. And this is what the reformers in the 11th century want to do to what they see as the, the kind of sin, filth and stain, filth stained um, dimension of, uh, of, of the, the, the order of the cyclum across Christian Europe. And the impact of this um, is measured in ways that recur then throughout European Christian history. So you have the humbling of kings, famously at Canossa, you have an emperor waiting in the snow for absolution from the Pope. You have um, shock troops who are uh, infused with a kind of revolution, this revolutionary understanding of society, this understanding that the whole world must be cleansed and brought to um, a new state of cleanliness which um, is turned outwards, not just against uh, recalcitrant Christians, but against peoples in the world beyond. And the, the, the most notorious demonstration of this is the First Crusade, which ends up with the, the capture of Jerusalem. Um, and it sees uh, new intellectual elites emerging who feel themselves charged with the moral responsibility, not just for those, for, for, for kind of local, uh, you know, um, local schools, but the entire moral health of the world. And these novel institutions, of course, are what we now call universities. And they are set up to try and fashion an understanding of God's law, which for Christians is something that is not given, uh, you know, via a, a, a prophet, not given via Moses or Muhammad. It's written on the heart. Uh, and this, of course, makes it more of a, a challenge to identify what it is. So universities basically emerge initially to try and work out what what the law of God properly should be, what the what how it is that the church should provide law, should provide justice as a kind of sovereign entity that is distinct from and superior to all the earthly kingdoms. So you have um, the humbling of kings, you have um, uh, militant uh, warriors convinced of their own virtue. You have um, radical new educational institutions staffed by a clerisy convinced of their own justice and uh, moral virtue, um, pledged to reshaping the world. And essentially the, the, the culture of high medieval Europe um, is Europe's first experience of a revolutionary society. Now what happens over the course of medieval, uh, the medieval period is that you get certain Christians who are kind of left behind by the sweep of this revolution and they get targeted. So the Albigensian crusade is an example of, of people who are a bit, you know, the deplorables, the people who are the left behinds, people who are not abreast of the latest thinking in Paris or Bologna or Rome, who are out in the sticks in the, uh, the log dock, who have to be um, brought to a correct understanding of, of what their responsibilities are. But you also have people who feel that the revolutionary structure of the church is fossilizing and that, it, and that it's not going far enough. Um, uh, and these also get condemned as, as heretics. But by the 16th century, the kind of the pressure has built up sufficiently that you have another great explosion, another bout of reformatio, what we today call the reformation. And the reformation, again, you get this, you know, king's head of Charles I chopped off by radical Protestants, um, you have uh, violent, war, what we call violent wars of religion. Uh, people, uh, Protestants, convinced of their own rectitude, starting to spread that sense of rectitude, not just in Europe, but across the Atlantic into the new world. Uh, you have new ways of understanding, uh, new understanding of, of, of what the role of, of God's law is, how it can be understood, looking into the heart, a radical new understanding of the spirit, 
that that the spirit will um you know if you have grace if you are if you if if the pentecostal fire descends on you then you can read scripture and you can properly fathom and understand what is there and all these ideas essentially um you know they the protestants cast the catholic church as the sump of idolatry as uh, as what has to be rejected um as, as the idols that have to be overthrown the darkness that um people have to be brought from into the light and essentially the enlightenment and the french revolution is simply another spasm of that uh, except that now what's happening is that in the enlightenment and in the french revolution it's institutional christianity itself that is being targeted but the assumption, you know, the assumption of Voltaire that it's wrong for um, the Catholic Church to, uh, to, to oppress people and, and to make victims of them is founded on the assumption that it's wrong for powerful entities to, um, say, to, to, to torture uh, people who shouldn't be tortured. And, and the reason that that matters so much to Voltaire is obviously because the central emblem of Christianity is the figure of an innocent man being tortured to death on an instrument of torture. Um, likewise, the, um, the, the assumption that uh, the values of the Enlightenment should be universal, that properly there is nothing that uh, separates a philosoph in Paris from a, uh, from a, a philosoph in, in Peking. Um, that again is a kind of legacy of Christian universalism, the idea that what is true and right properly should be something that is shared across the entire globe. And of course in the French Revolution, the idea that um, kings should be overthrown, that idols should be pulled down, that superstition should be banished. None of this comes from nowhere. It's, it's an inheritance of the very Christian faith that the revolutionaries believe they are targeting for elimination. Um, so in that sense, I think the Enlightenment is, is, is a highly culturally Christian phenomenon and its assumption that its values are universal which essentially is, is what underpins European universalism, is a massive conceit. Um, mm -hmm. These are not universal values. These are very culturally contingent values. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that, that basically the genius of European imperialism and, and, and the age of, of Western cultural hegemony was that, um, that, that Westerners were able to convince not only themselves, but large numbers of people in, in lands um, beyond Europe and beyond the West, that um, these very culturally contingent views and opinions and ways of seeing the world were somehow universal, but they're not at all. And I think that what we're seeing now as Western power and therefore prestige retreats is civilizations that, that are much older than um, you know, post-Reformation Europe are kind of waking up to this. Uh, and I think that, that last summer, both with um, Narendra Modi going to Ayodhya and laying the foundation stone of the great temple to Rama on the site of, of the mosque that supposedly had been built on Rama's birthplace. Um, but also, of course, in, uh, in Istanbul with um, President Erdogan's reconsecration of the museum of, of Hagia Sophia as a mosque. Um, both of those are kind of repudiations of the idea that the secular, which is a kind of inheritance from this fusion of, of overtly Christian and, 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 and enlightenment values spread by the, the French and the British and so on um, in the 19th century. It's a repudiation of the idea that these are universal ideas. Um, it's, it's a recognition that um, that is not the only way to see the world. Um, and I think it's an attempt to, to, to essentially kind of purge both what Westerners would call Hinduism and Islam of um, elements that are fundamentally Christian. But I think, I, I mean, I think in a sense, it's a kind of doomed project because if I, I mean, if I had to compare Christianity to anything, and I'm not saying, I, 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 I'm sure lots of you saw the, um, the drama series about Chernobyl that was on, I think, last spring. Um, and I think that Christianity is like that nuclear plant at Chernobyl. And by that, I don't mean that it, it kills people and makes your hair fall out, but I mean that its, it's impact is, is often invisible. So in that, in that drama, 
there was a, a kind of an amazing sequence where two of the, the main protagonists were right up close and looking at the, um, the radiation leaking from the rupture. And you could see it because it was ionizing the air. So if you're up close to Christianity, you can see its influence, it's evident, it's apparent. But that radioactivity was spreading northwards and spreading you know, across Kiev and across Scandinavia and, and, and out you know, across Cumbria and so on. Uh, and people were breathing it in and being changed by it and being affected by it, even though they couldn't see it. And I think that, that Christianity's broader influence is like that. Um, I, I think it can often be hard to see just how much if you, just how much it, it, it saturates Western assumptions, but also therefore how much it has changed um, the way that, that people from other civilizational traditions see the world because it has been so influential, so hegemonic for so long. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, there's, there's huge amounts there that I could uh, relate to in, in uh, what you've just said um, in various, with various comments. And they're all very, very interesting, uh, of course. Um, but um, I mean, I think one of the things that I uh, I remember um, reading about how um, you know in in the Roman world people didn't really treat human beings in 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 dignified manners. You know, people handicapped children were born to die. Uh, uh, you had um, uh, um, people killed each other for for uh, for for for, sh for commercial purposes, as it were, um, the gladiators and and, and others, um, and of course, you know, the effect of of that on you know the uh, the idea of human beings being um, being seen in as as. Uh, as dignified, there's a significant approach that it has changed, been transformed uh, in the light of, of, of uh, Christianity. Uh, it's something that I totally agree, I think, with, with your view on that. Um, but I, I mean, I think I'm, I'm interested in that engagement that you're trying to um, portray between Islam and Christianity here. Um, uh, to take that a little bit further, if you like, because <clears throat> I think one can speak, that would be my view, that one can speak of certain convergences between Islam and Christianity broadly in the distinction between religious and political authority, um, or if you like, between what is enjoined for the good of the soul and the good of social stability. And on that, in that, in that regard, I think perhaps Muslims and Christians could show together um, the effect of the, the positive effect of monotheism generally uh, on the wider public or on, on culture, let's say. Uh, but I still think that your distinction is still important in terms of that strict institutional distinction between church and state um, is something that characterized both, I think both Western and Eastern Christianity in perhaps slightly different uh, emphases, but still, you know, in the Eastern church, the Eastern church was not the political authority either. And that clear distinction is what never emerged, if, if, if you like, in, in, the Islamic, in the Islamic world. And I think that's, that is an important thing to bear in mind in, in this regard. So the, that raises questions, therefore, um, because the implications of all of this is a challenge for both Christians and Muslims today who find themselves you know, in the light of the enlightenment, let's say. Uh, the challenge for Christians, I say, because too many Christians tend to take the simplistic stance of defending religion in general against the attacks of, for example, the new atheists. Uh, whereas what you're trying to say is that they have forgotten that this whole tradition is actually, you know, 
wouldn't have made sense without the history of Christianity. Yeah. Um, but what would be the challenge do you see then in the light of this to Muslim communities who should feel at home and able to flourish in the context of a post-Enlightenment Europe? Well, I, th I think it's a challenge. Um, I, I, and I think that in a way, the experience of Jews in the 19th century shows perhaps just how much of a challenge it is. Because um, when you know, Jews was, was seen by Christians you know, as, as, as a people apart, and there were lots of Jews who were happy with that because they identified themselves as a people. Um, they, they, they did not think of themselves as belonging to something called a religion, as belonging to something called Judaism. A and it's the effect of the, essentially of the French Revolution, which capitalizes on the idea of, of, of church and state, of there being religions that can be separated away from the kind of important secular space. Um, so uh, it, it, the French revolutionaries have that understanding. And so they're able to say to Protestants and to Jews who've been marginalized um, uh, under the Ancien Regime, um, you know, you can become citizens. But the requirement for that is that, that Jews have to um, essentially accept French, French civic law. Um, you know, there is no place for, um, for the law of Moses in French civic law. Uh, despite, and, and you know, fascin it's, it's fascinating in that context that so many of the French revolutionary um, kind of canonical images show the Declaration of Rights and so on as written on stone tablets, uh, you know, exactly like Moses might have brought down from Mount Sinai. So there's a sense in which, you know, it, again, a, a, a Christian revolution is kind of sidelining and um, uh, uh, essentially demeaning the Jewish understanding of law. Um, and so Jews basically to become French citizens have to accept that they belong to a religion and not to a people. And over the course of the 19th century, um, basically, they 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 become more Christian. They reform Christian, re reform uh, uh, Judaism and um, Orthodox Judaism. Both emerge over the course of the nineteenth centuries, essentially as, as attempts to construct a kind of Jewish model of religion that can kind of rank alongside the churches. Um, and I think the same thing is, is essentially happening with, with Muslims now. You see it very clearly with President Macron's ambition to construct a kind of um, model of, of Islam that will be compatible with the French secular state and the assumption that, that this is what proper Islam should be. And, you know, over the past, you know, past kind of few decades, again and again, you get um, French, uh, European liberal politicians pontificating on what the real Islam is. Um, and <laughs> their understanding of what the real Islam is, is that it's a, it, it's a religion that is compatible with secular liberal democracy. <laughs> and the notion that, that any, any kind of, uh, you know, anything that might not be compatible with that is, is seen as, as, as unacceptable. Um, and I think that that imposes huge pressure on, on Muslims as it's imposed on Jews to kind of accommodate themselves to it. And I think that a large part of um, the, uh, you know, the reason why um, so many young Muslims went to Syria, despite the kind of squalid barbarism of the Islamic State and what was on offer, was because actually there was a kind of appeal in imagining that there was uh, a, a, an order where the kind of secular liberal norms that might be felt as oppressive in, in a Western democracy, you know, didn't exist. Um, and, I, I, you know, and I agree, I think it's also a problem for Christians because I think that, that essentially um, Christians in a way have become victims of their own success because they also have been marginalized. The, 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 this kind of, the, this, this notion of there being church and state with religions on, you know, 
parked on, on one side, even though it originates in Christianity, it serves to marginalize Christians as well. And if you see pressure on Muslims, to, in a sense, to, to kind of accommodate themselves to a Christian worldview, so also do you see Christians increasingly kind of presenting themselves as kind of agents of the secular state. And I've, this has kind of struck me very powerfully over the course of the pandemic, that by and large, whenever bishops pop up, pop up on the news, it's not to um, proclaim Christ risen or you know, anything like that. It's, it's essentially to kind of echo public health statements to say, you must stay at home, you know, wash your hands, save the NHS. Um, so I think it's, I think it's, basically, I think that the modern secular society, although it's not neutral, the fact that it can cast itself as neutral means that it's a brilliant, it, you know, it, it, again, it's like the kind of radioactivity, it, it, it transforms all who might define themselves as religious, often without them even realizing it. Um, and I would say that thought for the day and the uh, you know the world religion GCSE is kind of absolutely brilliant at at, at bringing this about the idea that um, you know that that basically I mean you, know, you go on thought for the day and it could be an imam or it could be a Catholic priest or a Protestant priest or a rabbi or whatever and you can guarantee that you'll get exactly the same you know inoffensive liberal opinions being served up to you and it might come in kind of Sikh or Hindu or, or Muslim or Jewish clothing but it's it's all the same stuff and again basically I, I mean my my children went to a Catholic primary school and they went to a Church of England secondary school um, and they went as you know good little Catholics to their Church of England secondary school they started doing the um, the, the kind of uh, um, religious education at, 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 <laughs> at secondary school and within about four weeks they'd become committed atheists because basically they were you know suddenly studying you know what 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 the hindus and sikhs think about smoking or something and suddenly they were basically being told there's no difference between any of them you know it's, it's all just a kind of variety of liberal opinions in assorted kinds of fancy dress um and essentially I, I mean, I think that that's why the whole, you know, religion in, in, in Britain is, you know, organised religion, doctrinal religion is basically kind of eroding away because the dominant cultural paradigm is one in which all religions are basically kind of tolerated as a kind of, you know, mumbo jumbo on the peripheries. Um, and the people who, who, who hold to them are encouraged to uh, express liberal opinions. And if they don't, then they're regarded as, as, as you know, beyond the pale and they're kind of shoved to one side. Um, and essentially, you know, that, that I think is the future. I think that, um, you know, I kind of look at my, I, my, my generation, we is kind of, you know, the, the, you mentioned the new atheists. I mean, I think the kind of enthusiasm for the new atheism is, is a kind of very Christian thing. It's, it's, it's atheists are, are kind of defined by Christianity in a way, defined by their rejection. Uh, you know, it's the God delusion. There's a, a kind of God shaped space there, whether it's um, Dawkins or Philip Pullman or whatever. But I look at my, my daughters and, and their generation and they, they're not defined by atheism. They're, they're, they're defined by their complete lack of interest in any of this. It simply doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't even intrude on them. They don't know the first thing about it beyond the fact that, um, you know, Hindus and, and, and Sikhs and Muslims and Jews and Christians all generally think smoking is a bad thing. Uh, and that's basically the level that theological knowledge operates on. And um, <laughs> there it is, mm -hmm. you know, and, and ev every culture, every society has to have a kind of dominant cultural paradigm around which other extraneous elements have to orbit. And, you know, this is the, 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 the kind of great mutation, I think, of the past decades, is that although the liberal secular society is, is, is Christian, unthinkable without Christian history, it <clears throat> is no longer dependent on it. It's kind of emancipated itself from it, yeah. as it sees. Yeah, no, thank you. I mean, I've, I'm, I'm going to... Um... Uh, we, we will go a little bit beyond six o'clock because we're uh, be, but in order to accommodate some more questions. My engagement with what you have been saying, Tom, is to try and encourage you to sh shape or share with us the theory that you're trying to um, 
you've been trying to expose in your in your very uh, excellent book. Um, and um, it's just I, I'm going to end with one comment, and then I'm going to ask those who want to ask questions to um, to do to do to to uh, send me in private chat that they 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 wish to ask to ask questions. Um, at which point we will end the recording, uh, and then the questions can be uh, publicly shared. But I'm going to basically, um, I'm very sympathetic to a lot of the things that you've said, uh, Tom, uh, historically and theologically, but I, I, am, I am also somebody who thinks that there is still more possibility of, uh, let's say, Muslims acknowledging the importance of debate in Islamic terms, even in the in the context of the secular um, Europe in which we live, uh, and I do think that this can happen without Muslims necessarily feeling compelled to say that the Prophet was fallible or that the Quran can err, um, because I think the Islamic mystical tradition, in particular, uh, has resources that stresses different aspects and different meanings. Um, as not necessarily tied up to the literal sense of the text, if you like, uh, even when it comes to texts relating to uh, sources of Sayyid Qutb, for example, the one of the founders of, of the Muslim Brotherhood in, in Egypt, um, some of his commentators in Iran um, provide a radically more, you know, modern approach to the reading of the Quran. Um, as they open up to the world of Sufism and, and philosophy as well. Um, and it's that sort of world that I, I, I get interested in, and this is that perhaps in this current context, the challenge for Christians is to understand how Christianity has shaped and engaged uh, with the current situation. And the challenge for Muslims is that it is the context where we all have to live, if you like, um, um, in a in a in a church-like mode of organization, and that, and that doesn't mean it has to be a private matter. It does mean you can have some engagement in, in the public sphere, but uh, it's that it's that challenge of organizing the community as a church body, which I think is perhaps the challenge for. Islam in the West. Um, but I think it's a challenge for Islam also, not just in the West, it's also in the Middle East, where a lot of the developments uh, today around the meaning of nation states and how they accommodate differences raises some similar questions uh, yeah. in terms of what, you know, how do we cope with pluralism? Yeah. Um, and does the does the the bureaucratic state can accommodate um, varieties without imposing one religious tradition over the over others, um, in in a way that sort of Saudi Arabia does or or Iran perhaps does? Uh, so these are questions that apply in different contexts. I think not just in Europe today, and perhaps that's part of what you were trying to say that this is affect the the kind of the residues. Yes. of of um of of the christian uh, uh hidden impact uh well, I, in contemporary yes, I, mean, I, th I, I think on that dimension um so how how societies organize you know plural societies so um the, the the way in which over the course of the 19th century the jizya was progressively abolished under western pressure and likewise the slave trade was progressively abolished and particularly with slavery, uh, you know, notoriously, there's nothing in the Bible that explicitly condemns slavery as an institution. And so although it's seen as an evil, um, it, it's something that Christians by and large for long stretches regarded as being um, acceptable. And of course, in the 18th century, um, it essentially gets industrialized and racialized uh, and the shock of this, the horror of this, intersects with a kind of radically 
purit uh, erratically Protestant understanding that scripture can be understood uh, not in terms of words on the page, but the the way that the spirit um, brings the believer, brings the, um, uh, the, the the Protestant who's been given grace to understand it. And the first Quakers, Methodists, um, evangelicals come to the conclusion that slavery is, is a moral evil. And this kind of sweeps like a, a bushfire, Pentecostal fire, perhaps, if you like, um, and leads the British, um, first of all, to abolish the slave trade, then to abolish slavery itself, then to feel that they are bound to expiate their sin by, uh, to, by campaigning to get rid of slavery, uh, you know, basically across the world. Uh, and this brings them up against uh, Muslim powers who regard this as nonsense. And when British Commodores turn up and say, you've got to abolish the slave trade, they turn around and say, why? You know, it's absolutely fine. Uh, the prophet had slaves, what's the issue? Um, and, and, and so when um, European power becomes so kind of overweening, and I guess specifically around the Crimean War, when um, it becomes a, a condition of British and French entry into the Crimean War, that um, the, the Ottomans basically have to start kind of looking at the abolition of, of, of slavery. The, the challenge then for Muslim jurists is to square this very Protestant idea that God's, God's law is, is properly to be interpreted by, you know, what the spirit tells you that, you know, it's a Pauline, you know, fundamentally Pauline idea that uh, the spirit matters more than the letter of the law. Um, and so I think I, I, I think that um, that's another way in which um, over the course of of the past 200 years, really, the way in which Muslim powers joining, signing up to the United Nations, signing up to all the kind of um, assumptions about slavery and about human rights and so on uh, that are kind of rooted in in both Catholic and Protestant the theological traditions that um, that this kind of has imposed strains. And in a way, you know, that's what Alamed DC is about, uh, is what Qutub was about, um, is kind of, is absolutely what, you know, the thugs of ISIS were about. It was a kind of sense that, that, that this has corrupted uh, the kind of the primal revelations of the prophet. Um, and again, I think, you know, I think that that's a, a kind of a, 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 a huge challenge is, is how does this, get integrated theologically into how Islam understands itself. I mean, I was kind of very struck um, by uh, a comment by Keisha Ali, um, where she said that um, uh, modern Islam is a profoundly Protestant tradition. Um, and I think that what's interesting about that is that even the attempt to kind of row back from this supposed Christian influence, uh, you know, that Kutub identified, kind of the solution to it again is a Protestant one, because fundamentalism, the idea that you go back and you look at the bare text and that's all you hold on to, again, is, is a Protestant idea. And it's Protestants who are first doing this. So, you know, there's a kind of weird paradox that in a sense, um, you know, Islamic fundamentalism, again, is a kind of Christian phenomenon, or at least kind of influenced by, by the way that Christians have tried to deal with this. Um, so it's, it's a kind of very, I think, a very complex, difficult. Yes. Yes, thank you. Now I'm going to, I mean, I, that, that's a, it's, it's a good point to end with that uh, uh, reference to, um, let's say, vulgar Protestantism <laughs> uh, and the refusal of sacramental mediation. Uh, and um, uh, I'm going to go to the questions that, uh, that some of our uh, guests have been posing um, and 